with me in your Bible to Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. We're still thinking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I know Resurrection Sunday that we celebrate annually is already come and gone, but I've just been hanging around the empty tomb. And uh, last week we talked about the Christian assurance in death. Because Christ lives, death has been defeated because he conquered death through his atoning work at the cross and his resurrection. This morning I want to talk to you about the Christian assurance in life. What does it mean right now that Christ lives? Luke chapter number 24, when you find your place, let's stand in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. Luke 24, you should be, many of you should be familiar with this passage, but I want to uh, extract some right now applications as to what we should, or what we can expect, some of the assurances we should have because Christ is living right now, not just beyond, the gra- or beyond our passing from this world, but right now in time. Luke chapter number 24, beginning in verse number 13, he found your place, say amen. Amen. The Bible says, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding, not the holding that's married to Daniel, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk in are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and were before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and Our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him, but we trusted. Notice that's past tense. We used to trust, but we trusted. That it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, and beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. You may be seated. May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. In his book, Disappointment with God, Christian author Philip Yancey tells of a letter he received from a young mother who wrote him and said that her Christian joy was gone. It had now turned to bitterness and continual grief. When she delivered a daughter with spinal bifida, a birth defect that leaves the spinal cord exposed, In page after page of the tiny, spidery script, she recounted how medical bills had soaked up her family's savings and how her marriage had cracked apart as her husband came to resent all the time she devoted to their sick child. As her life crumbled around her, she was beginning to doubt what she had once believed about a loving God, she writes. After pastoring for well over a decade, I have discovered that plenty of people have felt let down by the Lord Jesus after believing in him. Some have expressed that they have felt abandoned by the one they believed is supposed to rescue you when you desperately need rescuing. And then you have the skeptics that say they refuse to believe in a loving, all-powerful God. A God that loves, why does he allow suffering? And if he's all-powerful, why does he allow wars and injustice and disease and poverty and all types of human suffering? Simply put, there's a world feel, not just in the church, but in the world as well, of people disappointed with God. Now, let me explain something about disappointment. Disappointment usually occurs when the actual experience or result of something falls far short of what we expect. I used to tell people, if you get disappointed with people, don't expect too much from them, and you won't be disappointed. Amen? But a disappointment usually occurs when the actual experience or result of something falls far short of what we expect, anticipate, or hope for. For this reason, I want us to look and see from Scripture what a believer can rightfully anticipate, rightfully expect, from the risen Savior during this age, during this dispensation, during this moment in time. Last week we discussed, as I said a few moments ago, 
the Christian assurance in death because Jesus rose from the grave. Today, I want us to discover the Christian assurance that we have in life because he does live. You see, when we understand the truths of Scripture, when we have the right expectations and anticipations, then there will be no disappointments in the risen Lord, not in life or death. So in this message, we're going to walk with some followers of Christ who were deeply disappointed with Jesus. However, I want you to know by the end of the day, their spirits were lifted, their faith was renewed, and their disappointment vanished with what they learned from Jesus himself. And what they learned that day about the risen Lord in time, we need to learn because it provides real assurance and help in life. So let's, let's join this journey with these two despairing disciples on this lonely path of disappointment. Begin reading with me again in verse number 13. The Bible says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. Let's talk about this departure of these two disciples from Jerusalem, first of all. This is on the day that Christ rose from the grave. Of course, they're unaware of it. But let's back up three days. On the day of Jesus' crucifixion, and by that afternoon, when those three hours of darkness between 12 and 3 p.m. finally lifted on that afternoon at Mount Calvary, Jesus cried with a loud voice, It is finished, and he took his final breath. That was victory, my friend. Tragically, his followers didn't recognize the victory. To them, this was defeat as Christ hung motionless as the sun glistened upon his shed blood on that cross and on the ground. To them, this was defeat. All those that had placed their hope in Jesus, they would return to their lodging places in Jerusalem. They had traveled there for the Passover. But as they traveled home that day after Christ's crucifixion, the icy fingers of death and despair tightened about their hearts and their minds. You know the ones who went and asked for the body of Christ. They prepared for his burial. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, their hopeless hands prepared Jesus' cold body for burial and laid it gently in the tomb. So deep was their despair that not just them, but none of the Lord's followers had a single thought of him being raised from the dead. When it dawned on the third day, on that glorious resurrection morning, some of the women disciples found the tomb empty. Still after that, the disciples did not suspect or believe that Jesus was alive. Peter went to check it out. He wants to find out what happened to the body. But even after inspecting the tomb, instead of believing in the resurrected Lord, he went away wondering what had happened. Indeed, all of the Lord's followers were filled with despair on that resurrection day, though they had per heard uh, bits and pieces of reports from women from the empty tomb. In fact, you know what those reports only did? The report of the empty grave. It only made the pain these disciples had been feeling for three days even more unbearable. For two of them, these reports from the women that the grave is gone, or that the grave is empty and the body's gone, it was just too much. They couldn't take anymore, and so they're leaving Jerusalem. They've had enough. They're headed home to Emmaus. That's where their home was, located about seven miles from Jerusalem. And one of these departing disciples, we know his name. His name was Cleopas. We find that in verse number 18. And the best educated guess by scholars is that the other disciple, the other follower of the Lord, is his wife, Mary, a, a different Mary. In Luke 24 and verse number 14, Here's this couple in verse 14, and they talk together. They've left Jerusalem. They're headed for Emmaus, and they talk together of all these things which had happened. What things? The things that happened over the course of the weekend. And so let's, let's enter into this discussion. Now, the distance from Jerusalem to Emmaus would have taken a few hours to walk. We're talking about a seven-mile journey, not on smooth roads, up and down hills, and it would not have been easy but it would allow for plenty of time for conversation. Verse 14 says that they rehearsed the painful events. They talked about that which had happened over this traumatic weekend. They had so much to discuss, by the way, the heinous betrayal of Judah and his, Judas and his unexpected suicide, the evil conspiracy of the Sanhedrin, 
the, pathet- the pathetic weakness of the political figureheads, Pilate and Herod, and then the terrible injustice of Calvary, and, and now on this day, all the confusing rumors of uh, visions of angels. And by the way, they believe it's visions. That kind of gives us some insight to their skepticism. The women didn't report they'd seen visions of angels. They reported they saw angels. <laughs> they doubted these rumors of, of the resurrection of Christ and the report of angels. And so, let me tell you, they were discussing all of these things. And by the way, the discussion had to be intense because the word reasoned in verse 15 Susatine in the Greek, it suggests a strong debate. In fact, the word could refer to an argument. Perhaps they were disputing about the credibility of the women or the reason for the empty tomb. Regardless, this was a painful discussion as they walked. They were both followers of Christ and therefore devastated by Jesus' death. I'm sure they wondered as they walked away. They've turned their back on the holy city and they're walking away. That in itself says something. After, listen, that would have been the highlight of the year, going to the temple, going to the holy city, God's holy city for the Passover. That's their Christmas. I mean, that was the big holiday in the nation to celebrate the Passover lamb. And now they're walking away after that that what they thought was going to be a wonderful experience with the Lord himself to, to celebrate Passover with. They leave with this traumatic experience and pain, and they begin to wonder, no doubt, because they're people of like passions like we are, if God even cared about their hurt. Did he even uh, care about their confusion because they had given their life to following Christ? And he allowed, he allowed, God allowed Jesus to be unjustly arrested and falsely accused and unlawfully put to death. Don't you know this was an intense conversation? Did God care? Absolutely, he did. And our resurrected Lord understood perfectly the hurt and the confusion in their hearts. As these two distraught disciples moved ever so slowly, I I imagine they moved as slow as you would move in a funeral procession along uh, along the road to Emmaus. During that time, because this was a busy season, people would have passed back and forth by them and never take notice of them. But I want to tell you, on that day, the risen Savior knew not just their geographical location, but he also saw the sorrow in their souls. He saw their tear-filled eyes. He saw their sad countenance and troubled hearts, as we shall see in verse 17. In verse 15, the Bible says, And it came to pass that while they communed and reasoned, I love this, the delight in this passage is that we know what's going on. <laughs> Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their, high, their eyes were holding, they were kept, they were restrained that they should not know him. So notice thirdly the drawing near of Jesus. As they talked and discussed these recent events, Jesus himself fell in step with them as they were walking, and he's eavesdropping. He's listening in on their conversation, and for some reason, perhaps, for the development of their faith from Scripture and not by sight, by the way, that's where faith comes from, perhaps for that reason, to develop their faith from Scripture, not from sight, Christ kept his identity a secret for the moment as he traveled with them. And after listening for what the Bible doesn't tell us how long he listened in, but at some point, Jesus interrupts the conversation to ask a question. And he says in verse 17, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Let me say that Jesus' knowledge of his followers, and we can extract this from this passage, His knowledge of his followers is both personal and tender. That's why he's asking, in in effect, what kind of intense conversation is this that you're having? He's listening to their conversations. He hears their confusion, but he also sees their sadness. Why are you so sad? Let me tell you something. He already knew these things. He's omniscient God. But isn't that typical of our Savior to ask, why are you so sad? Because he's simply given them the opportunity to cast their care upon him. 
child of God, we may feel insignificant at times. We may feel alone at times in this life. But when we, in this text, see Jesus, now think about this in the context of the situation. We see him afresh from the experience of his own traumatic death just three days before and fresh off the life-shaking, eternal shaking resurrection right off that experience. He's now, let me tell you, he's the risen Christ. He's accomplished uh, the redemption plan in time. He's got bigger things to deal with. And now we find him monitoring, monitoring the footsteps and the tears of two distraught disciples. When you see that, we can be sure that we too, his followers, are intimately known and loved by the Lord. Can I get a witness? Unbeknownst to these two disciples, Though they felt further, I, I guarantee you, they felt further from Christ than they ever had. In fact, they're leaving the place where his body was last seen. Little did they know while they felt far from Christ, the Savior had drawn near to them. In verse 18, and the one of them whose name was Cleopas. Now, he's amazed by this question. <laughs> Uh, what's your conversation? What are you talking about? And why are you so sad? He's just perplexed, almost perturbed by this. Whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? There's a little bit of aggravation here. Are you just a stranger? What do you mean you don't know what just happened over this weekend? Everybody knows. Have you been living under a rock? Well, my body's been behind one for three days. <laughs> Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, now here's the omniscient God, what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty, prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him, but we trusted. That word could also be translated hoped, but we had hoped. In other words, we don't have hope anymore. We don't have trust. All that's broken. All that's over. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. They believed that he was more than a prophet. They knew he was the promised one, the redeemer foretold of in the Old Testament that would come and redeem Israel. But now their hope's been shattered, and beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so, as the women had said, but him they saw not. They're speaking of Peter. And so I want to draw your attention, based on verse 21, to the disappointment of these disciples. What they left behind in Jerusalem was just too painful to recall. Their hopes died, according to verse 21, with Jesus' death. Their hope, their trust. Nevertheless, in response to Jesus' question, what things... One of the disciples began to recount those painful events. And what I want you to understand is that they were so depressed and so negative in their confusion that it was beyond their capacity to make the obvious connection. Now, Jesus had foretold that he would uh, rise again on the third day. They're speaking of these things, but they're so depressed. And when you become depressed, you become awful negative. They can't see any good come out of the reports. If you've ever tried to deal with someone who's depressed, or if you've ever been depressed, you know that such people cannot find comfort in anything you say to them. A depressed mind is determined to hear everything is bad news. And that is exactly what these two did with the news of the empty tomb. That should have produced some excitement, but it did not. To them, the empty tomb only compounded the tragedy and the pain, for they assumed that the body was stolen. In fact, the news of an empty grave only added insult as far as they were concerned, insult to injury. So the good news of the empty tomb was bad news to them. And now the one they had trusted to be the Messiah, the one they had believed would deliver Israel from Roman oppression and rule from David's throne, 
he's dead. As far as they were concerned, Jesus had disappointed them. Jesus had birthed expectations, messianic expectations that he did not fulfill. Jesus had elevated their hope only to dash it into a million pieces. Let me say it this way. Jesus had let them down. Oh, how disappointed these two were with Jesus, and they did not hold back from expressing their disappointment to the stranger. But we trusted. We hoped, but that's over. In verse 25, then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, that refers to the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, that's the remainder of the Old Testament. He expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus begins a discourse after they had, they had cited some messianic promises from the Old Testament. Yes, Christ will return. He will, he will descend on the Mount of Olives. And, or, and he will rule from Zion, and he will make the Gentiles his footstool, and he will rule and reign in, in righteousness from the throne of David forevermore. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. The government will be upon his shoulders. I'm telling you, these are messianic truths and promises that they were claiming and believing in, and they, cited the, they cite these things. But the Lord lovingly rebukes them. He calls them foolish, slow of heart to believe. And notice what he says, slow of heart to believe all. Not some, all that the prophets have spoken. Certainly these two believers, these two disciples, they believed the prophets. But the reason for the rebuke was that they had read the Old Testament and like so many, they only believed select portions of it. They had embraced the prophecies of the Messiah ruling from Israel and and crushing the Gentiles that will come up against Jerusalem. And they ignored all the passages concerning his sufferings. If they had only believed and embraced all that the prophets had written, they would have understood that the Scripture clearly outlines that the Messiah should first suffer before entering into his glory. That is the sequence in Scripture and it's necessary because that's the way God designed it and laid it out. Now, if there was any sermon of Jesus that he preached, uh, whether the Beatitude message or any other message, this is the sermon I would have loved to have heard. This is the one I would like to hear. This was God's own exegesis of his own Scripture. Beginning with Moses' writing, beginning in Genesis, Jesus moved systematically through the Old Testament explaining how it all spoke of himself, how it all predicted the suffering of Christ to accomplish the ultimate redemption of not just Israel physically, but the redemption of mankind. He moved through the Scriptures and he opened and interpreted the Word of God. What a gripping revelation it had to be to hear Jesus' interpretation of the symbolic slaying of the innocent animal in the Garden of Eden to cover Adam and Eve's shame after their sin against God. That was a picture of him and his sacrifice. How awesome it would have been to hear him describe and interpret the offering of Isaac by Abraham in Genesis 22, which was emblematic of his substitutionary atonement and pictured his resurrection. What about when he moved to the book of Exodus and began to explain how that the Passover sacrifice and the Passover feast and the celebration, all that with the death and the blood of a lamb being applied to the doorpost was a picture of him, the true Passover lamb. It had to be something as the Lord moved from the book of Exodus to Leviticus and explained how that all the bloody sacrifices and all the offerings in Leviticus previewed the one perfect offering that he would provide at the cross. And then I can imagine he moved to the book of Numbers, and he began to tell how that Moses lifted up that brazen serpent on a pole for those who were snake bit and were doomed to die, that if they'd only looked to the one that was lifted up, that they would be healed. That pictured him. It, had to be overwhelming to hear Jesus expound 
all the prophetic details that were given about the cross by the psalmist David in Psalms 22, a thousand years before the Christ came. It seems as if you read Psalms 22 that David was sitting at the foot of the cross pinning everything he saw and heard. And then can you imagine the Lord explaining Isaiah 53 and extracting all the richness of that text about the suffering of the Messiah? The more Jesus opened the word, I can imagine, the faster their pulses raced. The stranger's discourse made sense of all the scriptures. It established the fact that God had said there would be suffering and death involved in the work of the Messiah. And so what they needed to understand, the death and the suffering of Christ, his crucifixion, it did not discredit him as the Messiah. They needed to know from the Scriptures, it actually validated him as the Messiah. The real Messiah had to suffer according to the Scriptures. He had to be pierced according to the Word of God. And he had to die as God's sacrificial lamb. And as they listened to Jesus, their confusion, their disappointment, and their depression melted away like snow before the hot sun. The Scriptures were alive as never before. Now they began to understand why the tomb had to be empty and why it was empty based on revelation, the revelation of God's Word. And that seven-mile journey obviously flew by as Jesus taught because when they arrived to their home in Emmaus, Jesus makes as if he's going to continue on and keep traveling past and beyond their home. But there's no way they're allowing this man who's opened up the Scriptures to them and setting their hearts on fire get away from them. They did not want him to go. They had never been so blessed by a survey of the Old Testament Scriptures. They wanted more. Verses 28 and 29. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, I like that, saying, abide with us, for it is towards evening. They're thinking of anything to try to keep him with them. <laughs> it's toward evening. It's getting late. It's too late for you to keep traveling. And the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. This couple urged the stranger to come into their home. The word constrain carries the idea of force. They're they're trying to be as forceful as they can. You need to stay with us. You need to abide with us. <laughs> and by the way, I can understand why they're being forceful, aren't you? Or can't you? They were, they're insistent that this one who is making sense of the Scripture abide with them. In verse 30, and it came to pass, as he, Jesus, sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them, and their eyes were opened. And they knew him. <laughs> Let's talk next about this dinner. What a dinner party. I can see Cleopas' wife speedily finishing up the preparation for the evening meal and then calling her husband and the visitor to the table. And in dramatic fashion, when they sit at the table, the visiting guest becomes the host as he sits at the table. He takes the bread, he gives thanks, and then he breaks it and gives it to them. And as the stranger broke and served the bread, their eyes were opened. And they knew that it was Jesus. Many scholars say that it was as they looked upon Jesus' nail-pierced hands that God removed the scales from their eyes that they might recognize their Savior. And I'd agree with that. In verse 31, and their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Christ disappears just before their eyes. As quick as a flash of lightning, they realized it was Jesus. And as quick as a flash of lightning, Jesus vanishes out of their sight. But they knew in that moment without a doubt that they had just seen the risen Lord. He was alive just as the Scriptures foretold. I wonder how they felt in that moment when they understood that they had been spending time all along <laughs> with the one they'd been discussing. What a moment. He'd been there all along. In verse 32, and they said one to another, Oh, did not our hearts burn within us? Holy heart burn right here. <laughs> did not our heart burn within us while he taught with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures? 
Let me tell you what's happened. Disappointment has turned to delight. That explosive moment was burned into their minds for eternity, and they thought now, are, and though Jesus was now gone, their hearts were left with resurrection fire. They asked each other, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures? By the way, let me tell you, that's what God does when you're sitting and you're reading the Scriptures. Maybe you're sitting here in church, and I will tell you, the Scriptures you're reading begin to set a fire in your heart. Let me tell you who's causing that fire. It's not the preacher. It's not his oratorical ability. It's the Spirit of God working in your heart, bringing that truth of Scripture to life. You ought to thank God when God begins to make that heart burn. The dark night of despair had ended. The winter of soul was gone forever, and their disappointment was transformed into eternal delight. And though it's getting late by this time, they're telling the Lord on their way there, you don't need to travel any further. It's too dark and too dangerous. You stay here. But though it's dark and the Lord disappeared, the good news that they now possess, it could not be held and contained until morning. <laughs> In verse 33, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known to them in breaking of bread. We see their declaration to the disciples now. Two formerly depressed disciples have become flaming evangelists for the risen Savior. Now, Jesus has vanished, but they're willing to trek those seven miles back to Jerusalem in the dark because they now sense his living presence. Otherwise, they would not have rushed from their table back to Jerusalem this night. Sensible people did not travel lonely roads at night in that day for fear of thieves and other criminals that lurked in the shadows and the caves along the roadside to pounce upon them to rob them, to beat them, and leave them half dead. But these two disciples, they have been infused by the truth of Jesus' resurrection. And so there's nothing that can shackle them, not even fear of criminals and thieves. So they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and some other discouraged believers assembled together. And they began to testify, it is true, it's true, the Lord is risen indeed. And let me tell you, he's also appeared to Simon. This was the beginning of a Sunday night worship service like never before. And while they're talking and testifying, Jesus shows up to validate their report and confirm their witness. I, boy, I tell you, I, that was some praise service, I guarantee it. I'd like to got in on that praise service at Burning Hearts Baptist Church. I would have loved to have been there, wouldn't you? <laughs> Now, let's spend our last few moments. I, I told you, I, I want to tell you, I just don't want to tell the story. I want to say, I want to show you what this means for us in life right now. What do we, as we apply this, need to know and learn from the passage so that we keep pressing forward with burning hearts as witnesses for Christ? And also, what do we need to know to keep us from falling into the pit of despair? Let's do a little bit of delineation from this text. There are some important truths and principles here that we really need to know and be aware of. One thing Christ establishes that is found throughout the Scriptures is, first of all, the principle of suffering. Back in verse 26, Jesus asked, All not Christ who have suffered these things and to enter into His glory. That was God's pattern for Christ to walk in this life. But let me tell you, that is a principle found throughout Scripture. Man that's born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. It's through much tribulation that we enter into the kingdom. The principle of suffering needs to be understood in this life. God has made it clear in His Word that because of sin, in this current age, there will be suffering until the consummation of time. And then the Lord Jesus will return, and when the Lord returns the second time, at His second advent, He will rid this broken world of the sin curse. He came first time to bring salvation. When He comes the second time, He comes to rule and reign, and He will rid, those, rid this broken world of the sin curse. 
which has produced all of the suffering and pain and injustice and sickness and all of the conflicts of this life. I'm telling you that because when we have unrealistic expectations that don't line up with Scripture, we set ourselves up for disappointment. We have too many preachers today and too many movements that try to tell us that if we have enough faith in Christ, we will enjoy only success and bliss and health and prosperity. Now, they're, they're getting something messed up in, in their declaration. They're messing up the order in God's Word in God's plan. What they are guilty of doing, those things are true, what's going to come, but they take the promises of the future glorious kingdom age and say that they can be enjoyed and experienced now, and that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not scriptural. And such bad doctrine, false doctrine, has left many people disillusioned and wrongly disappointed with Christ. Thus, when their health fails, or they watch their loved ones suffer after they pray, or they begin to see continually the evil condition of this world, or grow frustrated because they never seem to become financially secure, then they begin to feel as if Christ has let them down. But hear me, God has never said that the crown precedes the cross. Never. When Christ calls us to himself, he tells us to pick up a cross. And follow him. The glory is to come, but it does not precede the suffering of living in a fallen world and following the Savior, I might add, in a hostile world. Yet, God has said that there will be eternal joy, the joy of the Lord. There will be a day of perfect health, a day of perfect resurrected bodies, a day of prosperity and unending relationships with the family of God and the experience of his own glory whenever Christ returns to rule and reign upon this earth. But all of that follows this age, and this age includes suffering, the effects of sin, and we all feel it in the experience of this fallen world. So I want you to know that the disappointments and the dissatisfaction in this life when we experience these things, that doesn't mean that we should be disappointed with Christ. We need to understand what this longing in our heart actually means. C.S. Lewis said this, Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. If I find in myself, now listen carefully, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. The dissatisfaction and disappointments we often feel in this life and the longing for a world without pain and betrayal and death and loneliness and suffering and wars, that does not mean that Christ hasn't kept his promise. Those longings actually confirm that there is something greater in store for God's people. But we must realize and accept that that lies in the future beyond this age. Not only that, but we need to understand the promise of Scripture, the promises of Scripture. In verse 32, the disciples said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the Scripture? Depressed, discouraged, despondent, distraught were those disciples, but everything began to change as he opened up the Scriptures. What was it that resurrected the hope of these disciples? It was understanding and believing the whole Scripture. I want to tell you something. They would have been spared a lot of grief had they only known and believed all of the promises in God's Word. If we find ourselves hurting and despairing and do not find that the Scripture speaks to our condition and provides us hope to press on, it's not that the Bible has failed us. It's that we failed the Bible. It's because we do not know the Word of God well enough. You see, we cannot be greatly comforted by the promises of God that we do not know. God has certainly made some wonderful promises about what he has in store for us in the future. And these promises. Now, listen, we begin to learn of these promises. In the midst of the principle of suffering in this life, we understand these truths that God 
we'll provide and, and set things right and all that we're going to experience in heaven or in the kingdom of God, we understand these truths. These truths set our hearts aflame. They lift our downcast eyes toward our hope, and they provide us motivation to press on. How many of you know you need hope in this life? It's a world of suffering. Where do you get the motivation to press on? From the promises of God. You say, so we just... I got to look. We just got to suffer in this life and just hang on till we get to heaven. Well, let me give you. Let me let me bring the rubber to the road now. Let's talk about the presence of the Savior. You say, Pastor, you're telling me that I need to accept that there's going to be suffering, hardships in this life, even though I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Another might ask, Where's the help in that, preacher? I'll tell you where the help is. Well. First of all, let me say that understanding the true order of events in Scripture and holding on to the future promises that God has given to the believer, that provides hope. That prevents disappointment. But the strength for the journey and the help we need in the moment of trials and troubles, when life gets hard, it can be found. It's not pie-in-the-sky theology. It can be found in the Lord Jesus Himself in the very person of Christ. It will be realized in His presence. Do you know what helped melt the miles away of that road of despair? It was Jesus' presence, though unknown to them, as He communed with them, as He fellowshiped with them, as He opened the Scriptures to them. Christian, do you know that the Lord has promised to never leave us nor forsake us? Did you realize that we have been brought into a real, a literal fellowship with God the Father and His Son? Though we may have to walk hard roads and difficult paths of suffering in this life, Christ has said that His grace and His strength shall be sufficient. He also said He would not leave us comfortless. And my friend, as sure as Jesus walked every step with His two disciples from Jerusalem to Emmaus, He walks every step with His followers today from this life to the glory of eternity. Before sending his disciples away into the world, that would be hostile toward them. To be his witnesses, Jesus gave them this promise. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Christian, you can rest assured that you will forever have Christ's abiding presence with you. This is the real assurance we have for life. In death, I know the Lord's taking care of death and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know I stand in His righteousness, forgiven, redeemed by the blood of Christ. I have that hope in death and I have that assurance in death. But in life, I also have the hope of His Word and what lies beyond and I have the assurance of His presence to walk with me every step of the way. Let me close with one final application. That's the prospect of salvation. In verse 28, it says Jesus would have kept walking had they not have constrained him and invited him into their home. That scene reveals something of the character and the ministry of Christ, doesn't it? It's emblematic of the Savior's dealing with all men. Our God is a gentleman. The Lord will never force his salvation nor his fellowship on you. If you find yourself as a believer struggling and disappointed, don't get mad at God. He stands ready to commune and sup with you. He waits for our invitation. When I'm talking to the unbelievers, God will not force His salvation upon you. He will not make you come to Him in repentance and faith. He stands here and invites you to come to Him, to make Him Lord. And by the way, when you sincerely invite Him in repentance and faith to be Lord of your life, that's what He wants to be. God's not content with being the guest in your life. He wants to be the host. He is the Lord. He, he needs to sit on the throne. And if you'll invite Him with a true desire to repent of sin and place your faith in Him, to know, to honor, to serve, and to commune with Him, He will come in and be your Savior. Sadly, if you do not want the Lord, as the text reveals, He will pass by. How tragic people that reject the Lord and let Him pass by. Many reject the Lord because they live in a world of suffering. They live in a world of loneliness. 
And they live in a world that just deals them what they believe are bitter blow after bitter blow. And yet to reject the Lord is to reject the restoration of all those things and to enjoy everything that He's prepared in His kingdom for us. But the one who rejects the Lord and leaves this world, they discover that they have forfeited eternal joy and the eternal goodness of God forever. Instead of enjoying all that Christ's death and resurrection provide in eternity, in eternity, they will be abandoned to the place of eternal suffering. They will spend eternity in the place where all hope is lost. They will go to the place where all dreams die forever. They'll go to the place of infinite loneliness all because they chose the pitiful experience of this life or the fleeting pleasures of sin over the Savior and His eternal glory and joy. Friend, do not let the Savior pass you by. Call on Him while He is near. Place your faith in the living Lord. Repent of sin. Ask for His forgiveness. Give Him your life. Trust in His sacrifice for salvation, and He will save you. And then walk with Him and talk with Him. Walk in obedience. Learn of Him and confidently walk from this life on into the fellowship of His personal, physical presence in eternity. Because Christ lives, there is both assurance in death and in this life. Do not let the Savior pass you by. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.